Well, welcome. My name is Mike Yost. I am your host, and I am really excited that you could be here with us today for the next installment of the Sesame Smart Manufacturing Mindset LinkedIn Live series, uh, where in every broadcast, we challenge ourselves and our guests to think differently about smart manufacturing. Today, I'm thrilled to chat with our panelists about the future of sustainable manufacturing. And joining me here in the studio today are Simon Jacobson, Vice President at Gartner. Welcome, Simon. Thank you. Jeff Kent, Vice President of Smart Platform Technologies and Innovation at Procter & Gamble. Welcome, like Jeff. It. Jeff has brought along two colleagues from P&G. We have Steve Scarda, Senior Director of Climate and Water Technical Innovation. And we have Angelique Therrien, the Supply Chain Sustainability Vice President. Hi. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us here today. Now, these are the folks that you want to hear from, and so do I. But before we get to them, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you don't know Sesame, you should. Sesame is the U.S.'s National Institute on Smart Manufacturing. It is a public-private partnership, a membership organization that's driving technology research and educational content, and also building the smart manufacturing ecosystem through outreach events, outreach events such as this. Um, they couldn't do it without the help of their partner, SME, who is co-producing these webinars along with Sesame. So our goal with this webinar series is to zero in on a different way of thinking um, about technology, about leadership, about being a modern day manufacturer, about what is possible. We are streaming on LinkedIn Live and we welcome your comments um, and we will take questions if and as they fit into the flow of the conversation. So we encourage you to contribute. Uh, the event is being recorded and uh, you'll be able to watch it as many times as you like. Um, and lastly, uh, we do encourage you to get to know Sesame either through LinkedIn or at sesame.org. Their website has a ton of information about their mission, their projects, education, membership, and so much more. So with that, let's get on to the show and talk with our guests here today about the future of sustainable manufacturing while learning a little bit from our past. Um, it's not a new topic, but I do think it's a topic that has not been widely translated from the high level visionary initiatives uh, down into the um, tangible operating and uh, financial value at the plant operations level. Uh, and with that, I just want to sort of frame up um, the, the talk with uh, uh, some, some data points that uh, Sesame actually provided to me recently uh, from a sustainability management report from the ROI Marketing Institute USA, which says that uh, more than 35% of the respondents to their sustainability report um, were not measuring the impact of their sustainability effort. Uh, they said that the efforts to increase the impact on social environmental sustainability appear to be growing, but there seems to be a lack of connection between the day-to-day -day business operations and the higher purpose of those sustainability efforts. Uh, lastly, they said that six, while 60% of companies claim to have a sustainability strategy, only 25% have defined a clear business case for those efforts. And I think that that's a good framing for us to have the dialogue here today. So with that, um, uh, I would like uh, to give everybody the opportunity to introduce yourselves quickly and then just t uh, talk about um, uh, how sustainable manufacturing affects your role. Uh, we'll start with the PNG team and close with you, Simon. So, Jeff, would you like to start a little introduc introduction about yourself? Sure, Mike. So, um, I'm in our corporate functions engineering organization, representing the development of smart platforms. Which, to keep it simple, is what are the key data systems that support our safety, support our quality, support, and most importantly, sustainability data. And I partner with Steve and Angelique that will introduce themselves to try to bring those data systems and that intelligence to life to support our sustainability goals. Excellent. Thank you. And um, Angelique, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Angelique Therrien. I am leading the PS Innovation Center in Kronberg in Germany for P&G. And part of my responsibility is to drive and support our business unit to get to um, net zero manufacturing and supply chain and a water positive future. And of course, partnering with corporate functions like Jeff and other colleagues from corporates. And we are really here to serve our business unit to deliver scalable solution. Excellent. So it's quite obvious what your what role sustainability plays in your job day to day. So thank you. 
Steve, how about you? Yes, thank you. I've been leading uh, energy programs for our product supply organization for oh, close to 12 years now. Today, I have the privilege of leading our technical innovation in specifically around how we are going to achieve our goals on water and climate. Uh, so really looking, how do we find technical solutions to solve problems to help us achieve our goals? Outstanding. Thank you so much. And Simon, how about you? Well, I have a bit of a different job than the group from P&G. Uh, I am an industry analyst who works with practitioners, providers, and services companies all around how to remove risk in making smart manufacturing a reality. It's an awesome job and uh, very happy to be here with the group from P&G to talk about sustainable manufacturing. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you. Well, Simon, why don't we stick with you um, with the first question here about defining even what smart manufacturing is. So from a Gartner perspective, and then we'll, we'll move to Angelique and team um, about how they define it. What is sustainable manufacturing and why is it important? Well, sustainable manufacturing, let, let's be clear, this is very important and it's unavoidable. Um, it's also something which we're definitely seeing uh, a scenario now where strategy and technology have to come together. It's not, let me go do a very cool project with machine learning over here and do a more tangible business project over here. They have to come together. Uh, and also the core mission of manufacturing to deliver reliable orders from efficient operations isn't changing. What we're now talking about with all of that in mind is intelligently limiting the resources and waste that manufacturing generates while also maximizing the raw materials and the various inputs that a factory needs to run on. Uh, but for this to stick, uh, it has to be really supported by a system that's conscious and adaptable to the future because we're going to be looking at new ways of working, new behaviors, but also the combination of technology and performance. And tongue in cheek, in some ways, this is really an extension of lean because we are looking at improving operations by removing waste. Well, excellent. So, Angelique, maybe we could turn to you in your, your capacity um, and how your organization defines uh, sustainable manufacturing and how it aligns or doesn't align with what Simon just talked about. <laughs> so I, I think if I start a bit broader at the company, and there are two main principles that I would like to highlight before we go into manufacturing. Um, our company is having an overarching strategy based on four pillars, climate, water, waste, and forestry, and nature, sorry. And um, overall, our uh, vision is that we are always manufacturing a resistible superiority of products, which are sustainable. So sustainability is always going with superiority of product. That's one. Now we'll talk about manufacturing. Second, getting then in the detail, everything we work on has to be science-based always. So everything we communicate or work on is science-based. So if I go then into manufacturing or the supply chain, what we are really looking at is um, protecting uh, what we call a global challenge, which is greenhouse gas emission, either going to uh, net zero um, emission in our manufacturing and supply chains or transportation. Um, and we have also uh, accelerated goal for 2030. So that's the global challenge on emission. And then we have very local challenges, which is water. And we've just deployed what we call the water positive future, which is our mission to ensure we are protected all the basin and the water stress basin, specifically where we are manufacturing. On top again of the ambition 2030 we have. And the third leg is, is where we are working a lot with Jeff's organization and the BU, which is about data. So anything we do in the supply chain in the company and then in manufacturing has to be data-based. So we are really ensuring that our data is always accessible, granular and auditable. So these are the focus area and how it's relating to our company vision on superiority of products and sustainability. Wow, that is um, truly impressive. Uh, Steve, uh, Angelique talked about the four pillars um, 
and, and you seem to be uh, on point for two of them, uh, climate and water, right? Is there anything you'd like to add from your, your perspective to what Angelique said? Yeah, I mean, I, one of the things I'm, I love working for a company like Procter & Gamble is our mission. We exist to serve the, to improve the lives of our world consumers now and for generations to come. And, and so the pillars that Angelique described really do that for us. Uh, if I put a little bit more specificity around those goals, we spend a lot of time working on climate and very, uh, working very hard on those goals. We are looking to, we have a, uh, an ambition to achieve net zero from our supplier through our retailer, uh, and that's a 2040 target. And then as Angelique mentioned, we also have science-based targets uh, focused around 2030 to ensure we're making progress towards that, both in our scope one and scope two, also in our scope three, as well as in our transportation. Uh, similarly on water, we have a comprehensive strategy that includes wa restoring water to water stressed areas for people and nature, responding to water challenges through innovation and partnerships and reducing water in our operations to help conserve uh, local water supplies. And, and that's just, we could spend a lot of time just talking through all the different goals and the specifics, but we definitely are committed to having a sustainable operation. Yeah, that sounds quite thorough and extensive. Um, Jeff, I'm wondering from your perspective, um, Angelique talked about data and um, you know the manufacturing side and the, the corporate platforms and such. such. Um, maybe your perspective on what uh, sustainable manufacturing looks like for you in the plants. Yeah, so Mike, I think it's, as they stated, we have really, really clear objectives at a corporate and strategy level and they're very compelling, right? And they're centered on the consumer, and then, then it has to be translated into every employee. So as you think about data, the role of data intelligence, it's only effective if it's, if it's translated into the daily consciousness of the employees. So the data systems that we're building uh, previously would serve quality or safety. That was our obsession before, safety of the employee, as well as the quality of the products, a complete obsession. Well, now the data systems we're building are to be transparent about sustainable goals. You know what energy we're using how we produce the products what's in the products and so every employee can be very clear how they're participating participating in these sustainability goals so the challenge is actually building a data system that can grab that granular data and have it coexist contextualized with all the other enterprise data and do that site to site to site in a consistent way so it's pretty exciting to have these compelling corporate um, and company goals that are aligned for the consumer and for, for the industry, but then to go build these data systems in a proper way is, is what we're in the middle of right now. Okay. Excellent. Um, we've touched a little bit, Steve talked a little bit about some of the, uh, the metrics and things. I want to, Angelique, from your perspective, um, from a, especially, I guess, from a supply chain perspective, one thing goes through my head is how much does this extend down into into partners, either suppliers or or, or, or customers? Um, and then I guess just what types of metrics or indicators um, is, is your company using to be able to to measure and meet the, the objectives you've outlined already? So we have we have internal measure and external measure. So external measure that we are sharing on our uh, websites of our commitment are uh, um, around scope one and two for manufacturing, which can be um, the greenhouse gas emission we have in our sites, um, how much, how many emission we've been reducing in percentage versus the baseline for us, which is 2009, 2010 by 2030. Um, so we are measuring exactly the, this amount. Um, in terms of water, we are measuring internally the amount of water we are withdrawing we are also measuring the efficiency by unit of volume uh, to make sure that we are always in raising the bar in our manufacturing process because we use water for our operation, but we use also water in the product. So we are always trying to be more and more efficient and recover the water or reduce the amount of water. So it might be an efficiency or a total amount of water. Um, and then in the supply chain, so it's, I know we talk manufacturing, but on, on uh, transportation, we are talking about two kinds of measure externally, which is intensity, uh, which is a percentage, and it's agnostic to the volume we might have, and then long term, the total emission we have in our transportation. So these are the external measures we are publishing, and that's why it's so critical for us to ensure that the data are always reliable, 
accessible anytime and auditable internally and externally. And then internally here, this is also, and that I think that will be an interesting discussion after on the value of uh, sustainability. We are using additional data and metrics to be able to benchmark between our sites. So we have a total of, let's call it 200 sites, technical centers DC and 143 manufacturing sites. Um, so we are able to, to, to benchmark um, how much energy do I use? We, we call it wages, so water, energy, gas consumption, comparing the production and to make sure we are always raising the bar and finding the best in class by business unit, by country. So there are even deeper measure that we are uh, tracking. And that's the big part of the work we are doing with Jeff organization and the business unit. So so let, me, let me build off of that just briefly please. to make it clear. Um, you know, P&G has got a long history of our integrated work system, which has very foundational elements for, for the line teams and operations. We are committed to bringing those sustainability metrics to the daily direction setting, the shift changes in, in the clarity and the day-to-day -day decisions in the same way that we've done for quality and maintenance and other things. So we have to figure out what to measure. We got to serve that those measurements and then serve them into the daily culture. And Angelique spoke to that. We call it wages, right? So it's one of the key KPIs that are going to be part of the success model for the line teams, the operating right. managers, and the plant managers day-to-day. Uh, -day. And we're pretty proud of the process we're making and doing that in all these different sites. So Yeah. So for those who aren't familiar, the integrated work systems, is it is it uh, accurate to say that's essentially the, 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 the work that's happening day-to-day um, at every level and the integrating into it, the, all of the aspects you talked about, whether that's quality or safety or yes. sustainability. You got it, Mike. Yeah, that's the most basic way to think about it is our, our culture of how to do high performance uh, distribution, high performance manufacturing, all the pillars involved. Okay. Excellent. Well, good. Uh, yeah. Just to most, build off of that, one please. thing that I completely agree with Jeff that without any form of work system, a lot of this won't be achievable. Uh, we are seeing companies now add a pillar or add standards, uh, specifically defining objectives, metrics, but also new levels of standard work. Uh, that way they can achieve uh, certain objectives, not all of them. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the only way to succeed, Simon. I think the culture of this, uh, the culture chain, the mind set of the employee particularly in our operation sites is important and we have to serve the the, the data and information so they can live that out so no, I, I completely agree and would even take it a step further of you, know, you mentioned the daily management system earlier i think shift handover has become much more critical but also we have to look from a human side uh, at site leaders and shift leaders as well as they're going to be asked to be changing or to do things differently, change either some of their work or some of the ways that they coach and manage their teams. And that is a really big ask in terms of change management and behavior. Yeah. I would like to add one item here is, while we've been focusing and we are focusing on this daily management system and getting the data for the shift, as you were saying, so to make sure we are uh, uh, really clear on um, the latest production and uh, success criteria or KPIs. With the work we are doing, we are elevating the scorecards at, uh, it can be a regional level or global level. So all the data we are today able to um, capture, uh, store, clean, and then activate um, are available across different manufacturing sites. So the work we were describing, if I am an operator in a shift, then if I'm a plant manager or a uh, let's call it a market operation leader, I can compare all of my sites. So it's becoming not only a specific dedicated work process for a site, we are multiplying that and we are able to have a, an overview on all the sites at the same time. And this is really creating a huge benchmark opportunity. Yeah, okay. uh, absolutely. And uh, sorry to take us completely off course here, Mike, but <laughs> one thing to add on top of that is you're, you're capturing all of this new information and you're changing processes, in some cases, digitizing them. It's when you do that benchmarking, which for many companies is a nirvana in and of itself, if they can achieve it, it's now using that information though to influence other parts of the business. 
if I can understand how much energy or water I'm consuming, uh, that then has significant value to those doing some of the longer term supply planning for the organization and it's making that information visible or spreading that collateral benefit. Yeah, and Simon, you said something earlier. This is a, a very intentional extension of lean uh, as it relates to sustainable insights, right? We could talk probably for another hour and a half on what losses we're taking out because sustainable insights drive you to other lean aspects of your innovation, your process, your clean out, et cetera. So uh, just to build off your earlier point about an extension of lean, okay? I think one of the fun parts of this conversation is it really does get at the core of SESME and smart manufacturing. One of the really fascinating transformations that we see going on right now is, you know, we've always had lots of data in our manufacturing processes. I started over 25 years ago as a controls engineer, and we had hundreds, if not thousands of sensors on manufacturing lines. But we're now at a place where we're learning how to take all of that data, organize it and structure, structure it, as Angelique and Jeff said. And now we can really start to activate that data in a scalable way. So centralize that data, look at it from lots of different angles with different data sets, and drive action. You know, that the, the capabilities we have in data systems today are extraordinary. And our ability to take that data now and turn it into action that drives savings, reduces our footprint, is, is a capability we didn't have a decade ago. And it's been really amazing to watch uh, the progress that uh, industrials have been making in that area. Well, Je Jeff used the the phrase mindset for for everybody involved. I think the operators and, and everybody throughout the organization. Obviously, that's what we're here to talk about, right? A, a new modern mindset. I guess if this is an extension of lean, if it's an extension that's you know taken decades in the in the process, um, can you guys talk? Like, did it feel like for the the people involved that they had to do something differently, or is this a natural? evolution and extension of, of what you've been working toward for, for a period of time. Well, maybe I can comment. I think, Please. you know, lean targeted these particular loss areas, right? Uh, and they were born out of cost or productivity of people or material utilization. Uh, energy uh, was measured previously only on what it cost, right? You know, but there's there are greater implications of energy and water and others than just what it costs. So I think the mindset that shifted is certainly what it costs, right? It's also the impact that it has on your products and the impact it has on industry and society, right? So when you put that all together, now the equation for lean is a multiplicative effect that people have to think about in a much broader way. And then it becomes more purposeful for your product and becomes more purposeful for the employee. And then you serve that workflow and that system as a, I would say, a higher order version of lean as it relates to sustainability. Right. So to me, it's it's just it's a, almost a higher order awareness that we're driving and the data can allow for that equation to be very clear on a day to day basis. And as Angelique said, on a full operating basis, month to month and, and across the region. So to me, it's creating a, a much higher order mindset of lean and a much more multiplicative equation of, of lean. That's my perspective. I, I would think that have to be welcome for manufacturers right we've been doing lean forever like if this is continuation extension of that that that's good versus being something brand new another you know requirement put on our heads you know those sorts of things and i, I i'm wondering um angelique from a, a corporate perspective from us like you have the overarching strategies and initiatives such um like do people uh are they able to relate to sustainability in a more positive way because it has such a positive connotation because we're being good corporate stewards because we want this to to be how we operate or what's your experience been rolling these things out from a corporate perspective i think we've been uh shifting mindsets very fast so i think before years ago maybe sustainability was seen as an add-on and costing money Let's, let's be transparent. And we are evolving into sustainability is generating value uh, for my business. And value can be in different ways. The easiest one is what Jeff was mentioning, which is let's call it net saving. So if I'm able to track my gas consumption or my water consumption with the volatility of energy today, and if I'm, I'm able to bring that down, this is a significant amount of saving I can bring to my company. 
The second element we are highlighting a lot, this is what we call the BCP, so the business continuity risk or prevention. Um, back to water, which we talk more and more right now, as I was saying, we published that we are focusing in our company right now on 33 sites where we have water stressed, or we know it has been published by government or NGO that this area are water stressed, so we are focusing on that. It's a matter also of BCP, because if there is no more water, because it's getting dry, then it's a challenge for operation. So that's protecting loss. That's the second element. The third element, there is a big, big sense of pride um, and I think attracting talent uh, whenever we talk to technician or operators or line manager, uh, enabling our company to uh, deliver those commitments, which are pretty uh, ambitious because as a company, you might know all our brand. We have also different kind of large businesses. And um, so beside the fact that we can, through data, generate net saving cost cash and protect most, there is also this pride item, which is extremely critical. And then people can bring back home um, explaining the different concept and what they are doing for the planet locally for water or globally for climate. So this is a great program and we are turning into sustainability's driving value. Yeah, it's been interesting to see how that value equation has evolved over years as well. Uh, a decade ago, we spent a lot of our focus on efficiency and efficiency is still the foundation of our program. It saves us hundreds of millions of dollars every year if I look at the efficiency work we've been doing. But then, but then there was renewable electricity in 2010. We said, we're gonna run our operations by, with 30% renewable energy by 2020. And at the time it was like, ooh, that is a really big challenge. How are we gonna go and do that? Well, fast forward, uh, we found some pretty amazing breakthroughs around renewable electricity, um, our ability to operate some of our plants with bioenergy. And that has been driving significant value. Now we're spending a lot of our time working on net zero. And so uh, it was efficiency, renewable electricity, now net zero. And as we start to look at, how, you know, the initial thought process is, well, geez, how can you compete with low cost natural gas? Well, the truth is when we study our operations, we're seeing great opportunities. We start to think differently about heat recovery and is, is that warm water that's going out to a cooling tower? Could we bring that back into our facility? And as we study those, again, we're starting to see this new next level of savings that we can continue to drive. So sustainability and value have been linked uh, throughout our entire journey. And I see continuing to drive our progress going forward as well. Yeah, I think to hear you say that and then think about the stats that I read at the beginning of how people aren't recognizing the, the business case of this is just astonishing. And I think a, a real takeaway from uh, from this conversation that people should know that there's there's gold in them there them their hills right and um, should be uh, should be working to to do that. Um, does anybody else have anything from a value perspective? Simon, did you want to comment on no, what you're to, seeing? I mean, this is this is very much an integrated uh, approach. If we look at this simply in manufacturing only, we have to consider the situation of. You know, let's take a pharmaceuticals company that's doing cold chain transport. I spend a lot of money and I have a LEED certified site. All of that savings and efficiency might go for naught the second that a cold chain uh, or refrigerated truck leaves that facility. So companies have to look at this integrated. Uh, and I, I find some instances organizations might be digging their own holes when the sales forecasts are for products that are unsustainable to produce or simply just not eco-efficient. And that's something which I think for any company managing that sales forecast and then what's actually produced, that's going to be a very big challenge to continue to work at. Excellent. Um, maybe stick with you for a minute, Simon. So, well, I guess, does anybody else have anything else to add when it comes to value, either you know something that you've seen uncovered that was a real surprise or um, anything else to add from the, the business value side? Anyone? If, if not, maybe we'll, we'll talk a bit um, on the challenges side of things. So what are the challenges? Um, maybe, Simon, if you want to start with challenges you see broadly in industry, um, uh, and then obviously the P&G team, you've been living this for some time, so I'm sure you've seen some, some bumps in the road. 
I think the main challenge is companies are not focusing on what they can control. When you run with your arms wide open, not only do your arms go off screen, uh, but you tend to try and do everything at once. And uh, you know, there's market pressures for uh, things like scope three, but scope one and two, I won't say are easier to manage, but they're more ones you can wrap your arms around. And even then, the organizations sometimes overlook the need to do some baselining or especially from the energy point of view, looking at their energy procurement. And again, thinking about this as one big system, but if there's one uh, hotspot or one challenge that companies uh, tend to overlook, it's on the human side. And it, it's not the worker safety aspect. It's more, if you're going to set objectives for individuals and tie goals and remuneration to that, uh, being clear that there's a reward system for this. Uh, in some instances, motivation might come from the worker themselves, but others might be motivated differently. Uh, and just speaking on the financial side, a lot of this costs money, and it's going to change the way that we look at uh, some of the capital budgeting or capital spending within organizations. And that's a uh, that's a bigger a bigger mindset shift for a lot of manufacturers right now, especially when you introduce technology that comes with a subscription-based model versus a traditional license model. Uh, this is all big change. And for some companies, it's almost too much because they don't dissect this into what's manageable. Okay. Maybe Angelique, if you want to speak to some of the, the challenges that you've witnessed, but, but, but before we do, um, the scope one, scope two, scope three, is that a, is that a defined specification uh, globally or is that a PNG specific? No, it's, it's global. Scope okay. one and two, this is what we can control inside manufacturing. And scope three is pretty large. So in scope three, and I would say under my scope, there is transportation from one pack material supplier to our sites and from our, our manufacturing sites then uh, eventually to customer. So this this is scope three, but scope three is much bigger. These are the one pack material themselves. There is also the end of life uh, of the product. So the full life cycle. So scope three is extremely big. And it's a standard definition across the industry. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank it's you. only for greenhouse gas. Water does not have this uh, classification. Okay. Maybe speak to some of the challenges that you have seen or that you see yeah. or that others will face as they... they uh... I like very much what Simon said on uh, human. Um, so we, we talk ourselves, so the way we, our vision uh, and a strategy in PNG, we talk about workforce and talent of the future. I have to say that in each of the sites where we were able to reach significant uh, commitment or like sites delivering zero emission because they've been transforming themselves, you can see a huge sense of pride and a cultural uh, shock or change. So this is something extremely important. So we are going to the site to train and educate um, because then this, we see that it's a big value and attracting further more people in manufacturing. So that's great. Now, maybe more on the technical or economical challenges. I think there are a couple of them. We can maybe three of them. Um, everything needs to be, and that's the work we are doing together with Steve and, and others and the BU. We, we talk about capital investment to do transformation. And here I'm talking about legacy side that we need to shift to uh, um, zero emission. So we, we, we need to manage some uh, sometimes large capital investments. So all of that needs to be created under a roadmap for our business unit and region. So they can, as of today, that's what we are driving. We are developing this um, modular and scalable solution. And then they are picking this solution to create their full portfolio to get to net zero, if we talk about greenhouse gas. And then they can organize their capital spending year by year and look at their operating expenses. That's one, I think. So really forecasting, mapping, it's extremely important. That's what we are pushing a lot. The second item is we depend for some, some element on infrastructure. If I would name uh, transportation, a lot of, uh, we, are, we are talking a lot about electrical trucks or heavy uh, duty truck. Now it also depends on the capacity of the industry to produce those uh, electrical trucks. Uh, the same for hydrogen uh, grids. So we depend on this infrastructure. So what is important is to be aware of those um, development trends and where can I source what and when and at what cost. So again, it's a question of uh, roadmap and mapping. 
And then I would come back to what we were talking a lot about smart manufacturing, but data everywhere. We are constantly accelerating the way we are looking at data and integrating everything. So we call it LCA, so end to ends. It was taking us years before, now it's getting faster. So we, every time we are doing a change or a modification, we need to know at the um, uh, required granularity exactly what we are consuming, how this is getting organized, and it has to be standard. So the biggest challenge we've been working and pitching with Jeff to the company is we need to ensure that whenever we are getting data, this is standard across the company, the way we measure, the way we organize them, and the way we activate. And that's one of the significant challenge we are now uh, working on. So I would say these three would be the biggest challenge on top of uh, the culture and workforce. If I can just add to that, one of the challenges that often comes up quite a bit is the product life cycles themselves, because that's where you get into a lot of the potential redesign of a product or a process which will impact consumption, or when you get into some of the circular economy side of this, uh, design for reuse, or even uh, looking at sustainable packaging, these are all things that continue to pop up. And without a clear understanding of product life cycle, or even what motivation I'm going to give a consumer to return a product, uh, these all need a bit of thought through as well as part of an overall strategy. Well, Jeff or uh, Steve, do you have anything to add there from a challenges perspective? We are getting uh, short on time here, um, and I apologize because I got like 64 more questions going through my head right now that I'd like to ask. But um, yeah, Mike, so let, maybe let me just add, I think, you know, this can be an overwhelming task as exciting as it might be to take it on. So I think what we're seeing is a healthy balance, and, and Angelique spoke about it, that members of our company are responsible for the roadmap. Where do we need to be? What are the technologies? What are our partners? How are they going to fit together and be available? And then be able to articulate that in simple investment strategies for our sites. Our sites are not going to be capable to be making this, this roadmap possible for themselves alone. They need the guidance that the external partners can provide procured by Angelique and Steve and others and then made available to those sites to, to buy into on a phased basis so they can get on the journey and get to the destination. I think any company or any corporation needs to be balancing how do they build that roadmap and their partners by some entity and then be able to articulate that in phased investments that can be made and win, you know, every six months or even less in the site. So I think that's the most important thing we've also learned is someone's responsible for the roadmap and then the people are responsible for their local site investments on the way to that very exciting outcome. Because trying to take it all on at once is overwhelming for most sites who have a day-to-day -day mission that can be very intimidating to take this on. And, and even to take Steve's point on data even further from uh, from earlier, I mean, you get into now a whole new set of standards around building information management, uh, tapping into operational technologies. Uh, th there's a whole level of complexity that will differ by each site, and that's where the wheels can fall off very quickly because this, to your point, Jeff, could be overwhelming or frightening, but at the same time with the right level of investment, but also with the right standard tools, this is where those models do get built. And when you see, when a plant, ma when a plant manager sees one of his or her colleagues at another site being very successful, peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication becomes yeah. big and that creates demand and that drives readiness. One of the things I think is interesting in this conversation is uh, the goals are different and, and the strategies need to adjust. So what, what I mean by that is when your goal is to reduce or improve, you go after what, where's the really biggest area that we have an opportunity, where's the, low, where's the lowest hanging fruit, and you put a lot of resources on that. But our goals are get, to get to zero, right? Let's, we're going to eliminate our greenhouse gas footprint. Now, a small site and a big site, we have to do the work everywhere. So, you know, when when Jeff talks about the work that's necessary to go and implement solutions everywhere, that's why you hear Angelique and us talking about we're really developing modular and scalable solutions because uh, we need solutions not just for the 
few big areas where we can have an impact, but we need solutions to get every single site, big and small. We don't have enough resources or skills to do that at all sites. And so it does require a couple of things. One is modular and scalable solutions, but then the other is also a robust set of ecosystem partners, right? So we also have a, a really great set of partners we work with both on innovation, but then also deployment. So that way uh, we can partner and collaborate and, and tackle this together because it is a significant amount of effort ahead of us, build the roadmap and then go off and execute. Well, I, I would say, and then I'd like to have everybody give uh, one last comment here about what the future uh, for sustainability looks like, since that's the, the theme of what we're talking about here. But it does seem to me that future, whether it's one of these webcasts or it's uh, work through Sesame, the idea of how what you've learned and what you've articulated here translates to smaller organizations, whether they're in your supply chain or um, or just the rest of the nation, uh, would really be important because that's part of the, the, the purview that uh, Sesame has is to serve the smaller companies. And it seems like quite a quite a daunting task. But um, Steve, why don't we come back to you? Maybe just give us what you think the uh, uh, the future holds for sustainable manufacturing um, moving forward. There's two or three areas where I spend a lot of my time with my organization. Uh, the first is data. We've talked about it a bit already. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip over that one. Uh, renewable electricity is certainly a core part of our business. I expect it will continue to be uh, something that's going to be almost a requirement going forward as we look to decarbonize society. And then the challenge that we're working on um, today uh, on technical innovation is then the thermal energy. We're in an industrial manufacturer like a lot of SESME members and uh, looking at how do we decarbonize that. We're, we're, we are seeing both electrification, but then also thinking very differently about heat. So for, you know, if I think about the past, we would go in and install a centralized steam boiler and then run steam lines everywhere. And that's how we met our thermal needs. It's worked very well for us in the past, but that's when when fossil when energy costs were very low and centralized boilers made sense. If you look into the future, I think those systems are going to look a lot different. We're going to want systems that are more based on hot water. We're going to want cooling systems that are not based on air, but are also based on water. So we can take all of that energy that we bring into our site. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. How can we, rather than lose that, continue to capture it and then reuse it? So. I see, I see us thinking completely different about um, waste heat. It's not waste heat. It's all heat that we can continue to use. And, and that's where we're going to be uh, and have been spending quite a bit of our time. And then this, those final decarbonization solutions, we're going to continue to see big investments in those areas as well. Excellent. Angelique? So, yeah, so Steve was talking about specific focus area for technology. So let me maybe talk about the how and the why. I think where we are evolving and what we've selected to, so the way we are working is we are selecting, we're extremely focused on the problem we want to solve. That's number one. Um, and we ensure that uh, any solution we want to develop is scalable. And the way we do it is we are embedding ourselves into the right ecosystem with the right coalition. So the future is going to be more and more coalition and ecosystem. Okay. Since we open, open the PS Innovation Center in Kronberg. We have been running already three summits between 150 to 250 participants, internal and external. Every time we are tapping into external ecosystem by saying these are industry standard problem statements, which are big, we want to solve it. So we name five, 10 problem, and then we want to solve it collectively as an industry solution. So the future is really through those coalitions. So we are part already, um, uh, we are creating a part of different ecosystem. Um, and specifically, we're working a lot with institutes like Fraunhofer and different academia. But I think this is the future because we want to create with other company and partners standard industry solution. This is what will bring solution faster and at a lower investment. So that's the future for me. Great. Jeff, how about you? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I'll close just maybe some comments about mindset. I kind of spoke about it earlier. P&G has had a culture of safety first, you know, in all the information and 
support of the employee to be safe in the manufacturing and product supply environment. Also quality, the most you know precise, highest quality products in the industry. Well, I think the third leg soon will have to be how sustainable is our full life cycle of what we're doing on what, how, what products we're making, what materials are in them, how do we produce them, and how do we push them out to the consumer to be proud of our full sustainable footprint. That's what's going to be the, the change in the future in manufacturing is that that transparency, that culture, that obsession will be obvious to everyone daily and the, as we produce our products and as we push them through the supply chain. And we're already in those building blocks of doing so. Uh, and everyone will be able to, you know, if, ans- if asked, be able to answer that immediately on a day to day basis the way they can about quality and safety. Right. right. Okay. Excellent. But Simon, would you like to have the last word here on the future of sustainable manufacturing? Uh, well, I, I always enjoy having the last word, which is both uh, a luxury and a problem, depending on who you ask. Uh, <laughs> but I, I want to echo everyone's comments on this is the future, except we, in rare circumstances here, have to use the future in present tense, because we're talking about the next wave of optimizing processes building knowledge and understanding and to bring this back into smart manufacturing uh, it's imperative that companies start to really look at technologies like digital threads or even generative design not gen ai but generative design and start to include those inputs in both the planning and the execution of their activities because you're changing not necessarily the outcome Our goal is still to remove waste. Our goal is still to produce high quality products, to operate safe environment that people want to come to work at. What we're doing is we're changing the approach to that outcome. And that's a huge DNA shift. And this is where sustainable manufacturing can't be a bolt on. It has to be a built in to the way an organization works. And that's my closing point, Mike. Excellent. Well, thank you. And thank you all. Um, I have, don't even want to shut it down now, um, but it's been a great conversation. Really appreciate all the input from Angelique and Steve and Jeff and Simon. Um, it's been just fantastic. Really appreciate not only what you've contributed here today, but what you're doing um, you know, for the planet, for the industry. Um, it is just uh, world-class stuff and we're all the better uh, for, for hearing it. So I'd like to thank everybody. For- Mike, one closing point to that. I mean, there's, there's four of us, uh, five of us in total on this call, but behind uh, myself and behind the P&G team, we have to also include the multiple people who are doing a lot of other work on the same topics or looking at this. Uh, it's more than, you had four people representing us today, but sure. it's a much bigger ecosystem out there. Absolutely. Well said, well said, thank you. So with that, um, I'd like to also thank SME, uh, again, Sesame's partner in producing these uh, these events um, uh, and uh, hopefully helping instill a uh, uh, the right mindset. Um, I would encourage you again uh, as you leave the, the broadcast today to get to know Sesame. Follow them on LinkedIn. Uh, check them out online at sesame.org um, and join us again uh, at the end of next month for the next edition of, uh, of our Smart Manufacturing Mindset uh, LinkedIn Live series. We uh, host these events the last Tuesday of each month. So we'll be back on July 25th, um, uh, same venue, uh, talking about AI in manufacturing. So until then, uh, we remind you that when you think of smart manufacturing, think differently. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.